Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, well, I guess we've gone through the primary elections and, and the result, results are in. And we're now looking at the presidential election about two years from now. And it's already started. I had the opportunity to look at all of the talk shows this was Sunday morning. And it was very, they're very interesting. So we're going to probably still have uh, some of the same discussions that we've been having in the past. And uh, but again, I, I guess my focus is going to be from a local standpoint. And yes, we will talk about the presidential election in many ways because that's a, a probably be the first woman possibility uh, president uh, of these United States. I'm talking about uh, uh, well, actually Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and uh, wife of Bill Clinton, former former president of the United States also too. Anyway, but again, that's going to be an interesting issue. But I, I think the focus here should be here in Oregon, as you note, in that election, in the primary election. Uh, the state was was more red outside of the, um, the the metro area, which I thought was very interesting. But yet, and still, the, the the Democrats took over both the House and the Senate, and uh, and also the governorship with under the under um, Governor Kitzhopper. And we'll talk about that again at, at, on that whole issue aspect of it. But what we're going to do today is that um, we're going to spend the time like we did last week with the Democratic side. We want to thank. Um, Cal Henry of Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs and Bob Williams, uh, I, I put him at the Oregon Voters Digest, who basically represented the the Democrats, uh, Bob more so than, than Cal, and um, uh, and we talked about uh, their issues and the results. And now what we're going to do this particular hour, we're going to talk about the Republicans' uh, involvement uh, during the during the primary and where they're going to be going from there. And uh, my guest, who by the way will be on the phone, on the phone will be Art Robertson, who happens to be the chair of the Republican Party. And that's what we're going to do. So the, and uh, he's, he's, one, he's in Eastern Oregon, so he won't be able to be with us physically, but he will be on the phone. And the format then will be that the first half hour, uh, we did a piece on Art. He, he was interviewed here by me, here in the studio some time ago. And uh, it sort of give you a feel for who Art is. And if you want to get the full interview, you can go to the archives of the Oregon Voters Digest and our YouTube, go to YouTube, and you can look at the entire hour. But what I'm going to do now is that we're just going to, we're going to give you the first half hour uh, of, uh, of Art, the interview with Art Robinson, give you a little background of who he is and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and define his responsibility and involvement in the Republican Party. And then after that, we're going to take a break. And then Art is going to come on live via the telephone, and I will interview him in regards to the results of the, of the primary, uh, the second half hour. So that's going to be the format, and what we'll do is that uh, uh, before, before I get, we get into the interview, i got a couple of announcements here. As you can see, I'm, I'm still wearing my poppy here on my lapel, and uh, also my Vietnam hat. And again, I'd like to make the point to the vets, whether you are... Whether you are VFW, veteran of foreign wars, participate in any of those wars, or if not that, you were in the military, whether it be Iraq or whatever, uh, you, you've got benefit, especially the old timers, you know, especially those guys uh, who a lot of times don't want to talk about this stuff or too proud to go in and, and seek their benefits. The benefits are there for you. Very, very important that you get out. And for those of you who are driving around and you see people ha holding placards out there on the streets, especially now in this cold weather and whatever, saying that they're a vet and they're looking for some help or a couple of bucks or whatever, I would suggest that if you are a vet, if possible, stop by, pick them up, take them down to the VA, maybe get shelter, and possibly they would be uh, also eligible for some benefits. So do that. And for those family of you, families who have vets who have not gone to the VA, especially if, if they're veterans of foreign wars, please take them down. And if you're not, if, if you weren't veteran of foreign wars, but you had some, some incidents within the, the service while you served, you can be looking at possibly benefits. So please do that. There are a couple of, of uh, contacts you might want to give them a call. You got NAV vets, 
uh, that's National Association for Black Veterans, Inc., but they also will talk to anybody, any vets for that matter. And uh, uh, right, retired Lieutenant Colonel Nell Brown is the VSO over there, and uh, he can be reached at 503 412 415, oh, that's the facts, I'm sorry, 503-412-4159, 503-412-4159, they're downtown in the VA's building at 100 Southwest Main Street, the second floor, okay, and the other is that uh, if you want to support, if you will, the VFW organization, you can contact Commander Bruce Hall, Bruce Hall, he's the Peninsula Pep Post 1325, and uh, you can reach him at 503-285- 8468-503-285-8468 and consider becoming a member of the organization. Again, consider being a member of the organization. Again, that's Bruce W. Hall, commander of the Peninsula Pep Post 1325. Okay, that's the announcement. So what we'll do now is that uh, uh, we'll go to the interview of, um, of uh, the chair of the Oregon Republican Party, Art Robinson, and he'll sort of give you a sort of little background in terms of who he is and how he was appointed and the like. That's the interview. We'll do it now. Okay? Sit back. We'll the Oregon voters. Years here, here on the Oregon Voters Digest. So anyway, we're fortunate not only just to have the chair of the of the um, of the Republican Party for the state of Oregon, but a but a true American. You know, uh, I mean, just go right down the line. Very refreshing person or whatever. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going on an interview. Art, how are you doing? Okay, how are you? Welcome to the Oregon Voters well, thank Digest. Thank you. It's a privilege to be on your program. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, look, Art, you know, before we get into the politics of the matter, yeah. the first thing I want to do, I want to, I want to share with my viewing audience uh, just who is Art Robinson, okay? <laughs> well, you know, let's do that. What about, how'd you get here? Is, this, this, is well, Oregon I'm, your home? Or yeah, well, no, I, I uh, came to the West Coast to go to college. I went to Caltech. I'm a scientist, okay. a biochemist. And I, con I, I work on biochemistry, and I work on the development of new tools for medical diagnosis, for the diagnosis of disease. And we have a research laboratory in Southern Oregon called the Oregon Institute of Science. What does diagnose disease? What does that mean? What, what, uh, break it you, down for you us. Want, you don't feel good. What's wrong with you? Okay. And there are very advanced techniques you can use in chemistry, which we work on in order to de determine the health of a person, what's wrong with them, faster and more effectively. How so, long have you been doing this? I've been doing that for 40 years. 40 years? Yeah. Wow. And you started up in California, I guess? I started, in school, we right? started in California after I got out of school. I used to be on the faculty of UC San Diego. Oh, really? And then uh, started a research institute with my friend Linus Pauling. And who was he? He was a great chemist uh, from Caltech and also worked on medical things. So we worked together with that for a long time. And then when we came to Oregon 33 years ago, my wife and I and some of our colleagues started a research laboratory in Southern So Oregon. she was a scientist too in her own She rights. was also a scientist. And then I've also, uh, I've done a few unusual things. During the Cold War, I worked on civil defense, uh, protection of people from the effects of war. I've worked on the issue of human-caused global warming, uh, pointing out that the science is not consistent with really? the, the propaganda. You, know, you mentioned something else in that discussion about yeah. sickle cell. Sickle oh, cell. yeah. Well, that's, what, what was that? That was the first uh, molecular disease discovered. It was discovered by people I worked with at Caltech uh, earlier than I worked with them. Uh, sickle cell anemia is a disease of the hemoglobin molecule. It's genetic. One amino acid is changed. Hmm. And this causes the red blood cells to crystallize, and the cell is distorted, and then the cells can't get down the, uh, the capillaries. So that's where that sickle thing comes in. And it's called sickle cell anemia. The reason it became so prevalent is that although one fourth, of, if you have both genes for sickle cell mm -hmm. anemia, you're very ill and you usually don't live a long life. But if you have one of the two genes, you're immune from malaria. Hmm. So, especially in Africa and other malaria prone regions, People, even though uh, a parents, if, if each parent carried one half, one sickle cell gene, a fourth of their children would die at an early age, a half of them would be immune from malaria. And malaria was such a scourge that this kept the disease in the population. Hmm. And it was discovered at Caltech in the 50s that uh, it's the, the reason for it, that it's the hemoglobin molecule undergoes a slight change, the molecule that carries oxygen in the blood. But was the first genetic disease truly understood, hmm. and very important in uh, biochemistry. Are you still? Are we still experimenting within that area? We're still experimenting. The, the diagnosis is uh, is easy. 
but it is a little expensive. So the kind of things we do could make the diagnosis less expensive. Oh, really? That you're doing now? Yeah. Anything. Our work is to drive down the cost of diagnosis so it can be so cheap that people don't have to really be sick to go and see how their health is. Mm -hmm. That they can they can do it inexpensively, but. Uh, also, the therapeutic advances in sickle cell anemia still go on. You can't change the genetics, but you can ameliorate the symptoms. And so people with the disease live longer and longer as a result of what's learned about how to deal with their, their problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, and when, I, when I think about it, the reason why I asked you about that is here within the metropolitan area, they tend to identify that uh, a greater number of the population are African Americans. Yeah. And you, you're constantly hearing the whole issue yes. of sickle cell. This is because they lived in tropical regions okay. where malaria was prevalent. Mm -hmm. In uh, in Africa, where Albert Schweitzer was, for example, virtually everyone at the hospital, including the doctors and nurses, had malaria. Mm -hmm. Malaria is endemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, now malaria was eradicated in the United States with DDT and almost eradicated in other parts of the world until there, there was an environmental... Uh, program against DDT and now malaria has risen again. But it's a uh, special scourge in the regions of Africa. It's an African American. And, that's that, how they and that is the reason that it is prevalent in the African American population because it had made them immune to malaria, mm -hmm. even though they got the sickle cell disease. You had mentioned the fact that you were doing, in fact, you were doing, i.e., sort of urine sampling, if you will, of, of various diseases. Yeah, we're, we, we now, uh, the diagnostic medicine is the kind of thing we do. Yeah. Uh, we now can take your urine sample and mm -hmm. measure 5,000 chemicals in it quantitatively in a few seconds. Wow. And those 5,000 substances are mostly produced by your body in the process of living. They're mm -hmm. small molecules mm -hmm. that you require for life. If you measure 5,000 of them in a urine sample, you can pretty well tell what your health is. Really? And tell about uh, uh, your how old, how old you are physiologically, what diseases you're likely to obtain. Right now, we're, uh, we're making it practical. We've worked for many, many years on the analytical methods. Now we're calibrating them. Hmm. And to calibrate them, we're collecting urine samples from thousands of people, storing them chronogenically, and then measuring them and correlating them with their health. Mm -hmm. After this job is done, this kind of technology will be available to ordinary people. Hmm. Now, could you, again, here I am going back to this sickle cell, that's how we started this conversation. Is, is, is there still further studies that one would, might be identified? Could you identify the, those well, elements I, within? I'm sure that uh, the kind of thing we do, or the right. people in our field, okay. will make it easier to diagnose. Okay. And it will also make it easier to sell, see if therapy is working. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you have a measure of health, you 5,000 substances in your metabolism, you really know what your health right, is. Right. If you have a quantitative measure of your health, then you can change the conditions of life, the therapy, the sickle cell patient or mm -hmm. any other patient mm -hmm. is undergoing, and with something that can put a number on their health, mm -hmm. as you make a change in, in therapy, mm -hmm. it will change either better or worse. Once you have a measurement, you can modulate the therapy more intelligently. Okay. Instead of a guy coming in with cancer and you say, well, it's too bad you got it, take this drug, we'll see if you live. <laughs> you say, take the drug and we'll measure you every day to see how you're doing. Uh, and that means that if the drug is helping, you would see the cancer recede. Right. And if it's hurting, it would go, mm -hmm. it might not recede and you'd have time to try something else. Mm -hmm. So in sickle cell anemia, for example, there are, and I'm not up on all the therapies for it, but there are a number of therapies if you have a quantitative measurement of the disease, mm -hmm. other than the guy saying, well, I felt worse or better, which is not very quantitative, mm -hmm. if you have a way of putting number on the severity of the disease, then you can try different therapies and see objectively how they're doing. You don't have to wait a year and have the guy's health deteriorate terribly to know whether the therapy's working. You can find out quickly. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that our work's directed toward is trying to measure illness quantitatively, mm -hmm. so that therapeutic methods can be more effective. Okay, good. And who, who is this information for? Uh, we, we're a nonprofit research laboratory, okay. so like university labs, we publish everything in the open literature. So anything that we discover, we publish in the literature for everyone. There are no patents or, or rights to anything we do. And, and, and then anyone can pick it up and commercialize it. So CDs, people like the CDC can... Anybody can use it. Anybody yeah. can use that aspect. So of it. it's a lot of science develops that way, especially okay. basic research in okay. universities. And 
if you publish in the open literature, you give up all commercial rights, mm -hmm. but the literature is read all over the world, so whatever you discover is more important because it's used more widely. Oh, that's interesting, interesting. Well, now, I take it, and that's another thing that I was so excited about art here, as you see, I'm, I'm going down this direction, that um, uh, you're open for urine samples, right? Across the well, board, right anybody now, for that matter? Well, right you're, now, you're, 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 uh, Viewers may eventually get a, a request from us. Was oh, that right? Okay. Yeah, we, we recently sent a, a request to everyone in Josephine County. Good. Okay. And we'll be sending some other counties. And before we're done, we probably will have sent a flyer uh, asking people to participate in our sure. project, okay. Everybody in Oregon. Oh, great, great, great. But there. that will take, that'll be done over the next year or so. Okay, good. Well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll, we've got that information. So when you get a, a, a request for a urine sample from okay. us, okay. you'll know why. You, is there a website that one can go to? And uh, well, you can go to the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine website, but okay. you don't go there to sign up to participate, right. although you could. Right. I think the flyer's on there, and you're right. welcome to participate if you want to sign okay. up. So it's it's on that website. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. And how is it named? How's That's oism.org. Okay. okay uh, Oregon good. Institute of Science okay. and Medicine. And it would denote, i.e., urine sample and. Well, then it. you'd see the project. You see the project on there. Okay. And you'd see a flyer about it. You see the flyer we're sending out. That sounds good. Okay. Well, you can see, folks, that, that that article that I read in Oregonian was very interesting. That's why I, I sort of targeted that particular aspect. That was another area that I was very interested in, yeah. and the whole issue of the fact that um, your wife, I guess, had passed away, yeah. and you talked about the the education of your kids, the homeschool. Yeah, we talk about that. What, well, I have six. Well, they're young people now. Yeah, they're right, not right. children anymore. But uh, my wife and I had six children. She was a scientist also. We worked together. Here in Oregon. You had them all. Yeah. And, well, we born, two were born before we came here. Okay. No, two before we came okay. here. Okay. And she was homeschooling them. Mm -hmm. But she died when they were ages one and a half to 12. So I had to continue the education. Mm -hmm. But I had to also make a living. Mm -hmm. So we uh, kept our homeschool going, but without a teacher. Uh, it was uh, it's self-taught, and this worked very well for us, it's remarkably well. So uh, people advised us to make it possible for others. So my uh, when they were truly children, they scanned all of the books and materials they used for their education onto 22 CD-ROMs, started selling it, and 60,000 homeschool students now use their curriculum, hmm. and that's the way the children work their way through college, hmm. Hmm. selling. Homeschool curriculum. If I were to ask you, I'm sure being a being a scientist that you were, you you probably did your you did your homework in regards mm -hmm. to even public schools. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and but the bottom line, if I were to ask you, uh, were you, were you did you research that aspect of it and did well, you yes. look at those options in terms oh, yes. of going to public we, schools? We did, and, and the uh, I must say, American public schools uh, historically were truly excellent. When I went to the schools 50 years ago, American public schools were the best in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a great education that got me into Caltech, and I've had a wonderful life in science, which I owe initially to those public schools. Mm -hmm. But over the last 50 years, we've had the encroachment of the public employee unions, uh, the state government, the federal government, and they've taken control of our schools away from our local people. Mm -hmm. And when they were locally controlled, the competition between the localities and the school districts and the, all of the resources being allocated by people who knew the students, they, they were part of the local community. When the local community controlled the schools, we had the best schools in the world. Mm -hmm. Now that local control has been ceded to big government and big unions. And the result is the United States is about 20th in the world, and it's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And also we have tremendous heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. In our country, some schools are still good, but in many of the uh, less affluent sections, our schools are really mm -hmm. very, very poor. And this injures a student for life, because if he doesn't learn basic skills, then he has trouble in life. Mm -hmm. He can be very, very smart, mm -hmm. brilliant, but without uh, a fundamental academic education mm -hmm. in math and reading, you know, and, mm -hmm. and simple things. Uh, you're hurt in life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you plan to do. Uh, good education is good oh, for everyone. Oh, very much so. so. So as a result of the homeschool, so the, the, your, was your the homeschool movement okay. uh, only has about three million people in it. Mm. There was no such thing when I went to school, mm -hmm. and there shouldn't be any need for it. Mm -hmm. But with the public schools being taken away from local control and the quality going down, uh, more and more people want to educate their children at home because the schools aren't doing the job.
Mm -hmm. And we definitely have an issue right here in the Portland metropolitan area. Oh, that. yes, and in Portland, uh, the average uh, educational uh, cost of a student is $10,000 per year. Mm -hmm. In Portland, it's 14000 mm -hmm. And the uh, only far less than half, probably a third of that money actually goes to the classroom. Mm -hmm. All the rest goes to special interests that have their money, their hands in the money. So uh, one of the reasons they've deteriorated is that as state and federal government and, and these public employee unions got control of the schools, then the special interests got the money. Mm. So, I mean, if, for example, the average across the country is 10,000 per student. So in a 30 student classroom, that's $300,000. Mm. But if you think the classroom with 30 students anywhere in the state is getting three hundred thousand dollars to teach with, so you're crazy. You know, the, the teacher uh, is paid only a tiny fraction of that, and only maybe a hundred thousand of the three hundred thousand reaches that classroom, mm -hmm. and the rest goes to special interests. And those special interests generally screw up the education mm -hmm. because they tell the teachers what to do when the teachers are trying to do their job. You know, that's a good point. So I'm I'm a I'm a, a the public schools in the United States for couple of centuries basically mm -hmm. were the best in the world but they were run by the local people the parents the PTAs the local people who were concerned about the education Making sure of their money got into the classroom yeah and they and, and the they also were concerned about their students because mm -hmm. they were local mm -hmm. and they competed with other local school mm -hmm. districts mm -hmm. it's this taking the schools away from local control that is our problem and we need to fix it okay okay now let's go back to your school your home school what yeah. was the results of your homeschool with the, with the kids? Oh, it was, it was truly excellent. They, uh, four of them have doctoral degrees, and two are still working on it. What was that again? Uh, four, four, four of my six children have doctorates now, and two of them are still working on those degrees. And uh, three of them were in college only two years because they skipped two years of college uh, because they learned a lot more in their homeschool than they would have in a public school. It's my understanding you, you wrote some of that curriculum, too, for them, right? Well, we worked yeah. on it together. Worked on it. Yeah. yeah. This was with whom? You and, you and your wife, you mean? No, she was gone. Okay, uh, she was the gone. reason okay. we developed the, the self-teaching homeschool curriculum is because she was gone, and mm -hmm. we didn't have a teacher. Mm -hmm. I see. In most homeschools, the mother serves as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I see. But we didn't have one. And this, uh, the curriculum is especially popular because uh, a lot of people, like uh, single parents, uh, who have to work, they can't be a teacher. They don't have a second parent, mm -hmm. and those people uh, can educate their children because they don't have to help them. The curriculum's laid out so the child learns by himself. Mm -hmm. Is my understanding some of the cohorts are happen to be some of the kids or some of the grown men now? Yeah, yeah. Well, all of how many? How many are working working with you in the? In the, in the well, all of us work church. together from one way or another. Uh, we have still the seven of us. My six children and I work together. But they also have things in their own right. Two of them are veterinarians. Uh, one's a chemist. One's a nuclear engineer. Wow. And they're, uh, but we all work together. Wow. wow. Well, now, let's come up. Now we're getting ready to get into the politics of this. Okay, thing. well, now. All right. I'm, now, now I'm how did you, trouble when, when did you're you a first, smart politician. No, by no means. I'm very low key. I, I'm uh, a scientist who just uh, fell into politics because I wanted to, to try to help, help a little. How did it happen? You yeah, yeah. know about politics. <laughs> how did that happen, Art? Well, uh, just an accident, my sons and I went to a town hall meeting that Peter DeFazio held. Okay. And we you, came, just curiosity? Uh, yeah, I've forgotten why we went to the okay, meeting. It okay. was just downtown in Cave Junction. And uh, we came home shaking our heads, saying that that can't be our congressman. Now, Peter, Peter he's a congressman, right? He's a congressman from District 4. District 4, okay. And he's a big government man. Okay. But we, uh, we didn't like what we saw. But there was a good Republican running against him, and we thought, that's great. We hope that he'll lose. Yeah, right. But that man dropped out of the race at the last minute, and my sons and I sat down and said, well, why don't we try it? Yeah. We didn't know what we were getting into, but we ran against him, and we did pretty well, and we're still running against him. We were trying to beat him. Now, it's my understanding you'd, you'd run several times before that. We ran twice. You ran twice yeah. against DeFazio. DeFazio. Okay, that's so the, the only thing we've ever done. That was the first time. Then the, sec the first time you ran. Right? I, I, yeah. How did you end up? What, what, what uh, I got 44%. 44%? Yeah. First time? First time. Well, you've never run for dog catcher or anything no, like that? No, no, nothing. That was as it? No, as it. No. Now, the second time you're running, what Well, the what, second time, that happening. was uh, last time. Okay. And the presidential race right. and the uh, remarkable showing of, of Mr. Obama, you know, who got right. a huge right. vote. 
that diminished all the Republican votes. So we got 10,000 more votes in 2012, but we got a lower percentage because mm. of the fact that it was a presidential year and the Democrats were doing so there well. There were some other little things about that particular time that uh, I guess one of the sons had run. Oh, that was another thing. Yeah, one day my, my youngest son, Matthew, who was 26, came in. He says, uh, I think I'll change my registration against run against DeFazio in his primary. And uh, we, it was his thing. We said, really? And he said, yeah, I'm going to do this. So he did it. And it was remarkable. Uh, he, DeFazio hadn't had opposition in his primary for 20 years. Def uh, Matthew got 20% of the Democrats in our, in our county, 10 across the districts, and uh, did exceptionally well. Because you see, political issues, they're not Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. They're uh, American values and which politicians, mm -hmm. individuals, not parties, but which people will best represent us and maintain our freedom and maintain our prosperity and give everyone in this country a good life. Mm -hmm. And the, these issues are not partisan. So uh, if you go out and explain to the people what we stand for, our issues are not even Republican issues. Mm -hmm. uh, they were codified in the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Before that, the American settlers, starting at Plymouth Rock, uh, developed these. And in fact, they're in books going back to antiquity. They're in the mm. Bible. Mm. The best way for men and women to live together has been known for thousands of years. <laughs> and uh, we're just representing those values. Mm -hmm. And when you take those values into the, into the electorate and talk about them, it doesn't matter what party they're in. Mm. We just had an election down in Josephine County where we won four to one. How did that happen? Uh, the, the issues were explained to the voters in a way that they understood. Mm -hmm. What was the issue that you The I issue there was, was government overreach. The county commissioners were trying to put in a, uh, a bureaucrat who would have search and seizure powers over the whole county. He could go around, he could knock on your door and demand to see whether you fixed your plumbing without a permit, this kind of stuff. Heavy fines, the fines going to pay the people who were assessing the fines. It's, it's just a really... Uh, draconian government overreach, but it has come to some counties. Mm -hmm. And our county didn't want it, but they didn't know it. <laughs> so we took the issues out and explained it to them carefully. And Josephine County has 42% Republican, mm -hmm. but we got 79% of the vote. Hmm. Because the issue of human freedom, uh, the desire to be free, to be your own man, to be free, to do what you want to do in life, as mm -hmm. long as you don't encroach on your neighbor, that's built into everybody. Hmm. <laughs> so when the voter visualized that hearing officer knocking on their door and demanding entrance into their living room, they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other thing that I was kind of interested in our conversation was, you know, I've run for office too before, and, and, uh, and knowing politics as I've known politics, it can get very dirty. Yes. And you made mention about the fact that DeFazio <laughs> has kind of, uh, you know, he basically, because he's been in there for quite some time. He, he, 25 years. 25 years yeah. in that deal aspect of it. And, um, and, and so, anyway, there, there were some things that happened, because uh, I noticed I, I saw you on um, MSNBC oh, yeah. with Maddow. Uh, uh, yeah. And, um, and uh, would you mind sharing some of the things that uh, well, they, you experienced? Let's put it way. The opposition, you see, it's, it, with good, solid American values. Whether you're a Republican, Democrat, constitutionalist, the question is what your values are and what you will do if elected. Mm -hmm. Those values you communicate, it's our job, if we represent them, to communicate them to the voters so that they will decide that we should represent them. Uh, it's the other side's job to keep us from communicating. And the way they do it is by not telling the truth. So uh, I'm astonished there's a... Uh, sort of straw man in our district, and he walks around the district. He's a terrible person. He has all kinds of horrible characteristics. And his name is Art Robinson. He has the same name as me. <laughs> <laughs> He's a creation of Mr. DeFazio, you oh. see. And they, uh, they tell a lot of tales they shouldn't tell. Mm -hmm. You have to have kind of a thick skin to run for office in this country. Yes, very much so. so yeah, very uh, much so. I, uh, it would be humorous, actually, uh, humorous what they do except that it's so important it's so serious because it, when they do the wrong thing our people become less prosperous mm -hmm. they have less fewer opportunities in life it's harmful to all of us mm -hmm. uh, here my family decided to work on this because we saw real problems in our country mm -hmm. and we didn't want these problems to get worse 
And yet, look at us. We're, we have all the advantages. We have these doctoral educations. We're scientists. We're the kind of people you'd think would be able to do do good things. Mm -hmm. Yet every turn around, time we turn around, we can't do what we need to do. Our medical research is impeded. All kinds of things are impeded because there's too much government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'd like to, we decided we wanted to help a little bit. That's why we did it. Not because we just happened to run into this guy, mm -hmm. <coughs> pardon me, but because uh, the government overreach mm -hmm. uh, has gotten so bad that productive people can't accomplish things that they would, mm -hmm. and that hurts us all. Mm -hmm. You know, again, again, uh, and I'm not trying. I'm not trying to quote just jump on DeFazio just over and over and over. But the bottom line is that uh... you are watching Oregon Votes Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Okay, welcome back, folks. Uh, well, okay, well, now you've, 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 you've been given the opportunity to, to see Art, a little background on who he, who he is, for those of you who've not seen him before. And he does represent the Republican Party for the state of Oregon. He is the chair of the Republican Party. And so we've got him on the line. Art, are you there? Is Art there? Okay, let's get Art on the line. And what we're going to do now is that we're just going to have a a good interview with Art and kind of get a little background of uh, what happened during the primary and the results of the primary, especially in Oregon, and uh, get a better feel. And then we'll probably get into uh, where is he, where is the Republican Party going to go from here, being that after the state, it's kind of interesting. The state, the majority of the state is red, and the only uh, uh, the only small part, which is the, sort of the majority of voters, is basically sitting up sort of north, if you will. Multnomah County, Clackamas, and in that area. So um, it's going to be very interesting. So I'm really looking forward to, to Art uh, just responding to some of the questions that we're going to be asking him, okay? All right. Is Art there? Is Art there? Is, yeah. Okay. Art, how you doing? Okay. How are you, Bruce? Good, good, good. Great, great, great. Well, hey, look, what we did was that uh, we gave them an introduction of one of our interviews uh, for the first first half hour. And so now we're just going to go through some, you know, some updates on the party as, as you see it, being the chair of the Republican Party. And uh, so why don't we just, just jump on in? You want to get a little quick intro and then I'll go from there? Okay, well, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, we, uh, of course, didn't do very well in these elections in Oregon. The Republican Party uh, had some great candidates and uh, we didn't do good. And we elected some good ones for the state house and other offices, but we didn't do enough. Many of our uh, excellent candidates were defeated, so we have to do a better job in the future. Okay, all right. Well, Art, uh, tell me. Uh, let's 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 first off let's deal with the congressional races that, for that matter. And it's my understanding you you were running. You you ran for for office, right? That's right. I ran in District Four for how'd Congress. You, how'd you how'd, Yeah. How'd you fare out as a candidate? How'd you fare out as a candidate? And what were people telling you in in regards to uh, what their concerns were as you were knocking on doors? Well, the main concerns uh, of the people are uh, jobs. That's the economy. Jobs, uh, education, and interestingly, term limits. Uh, they're fed up with these career politicians. Those are the best. Going into the election, those were the three uh, things that resonated with the public the most. Since the uh, ISIS thing uh, uh, blew up over in Iraq and Syria, uh, that was added because people were, again, concerned about military affairs. So those four things, there were other, lots of other issues, but those are the four things that most people were most concerned about. And in District 4, uh, jobs is a special problem because uh, on the watch of our congressman, uh, during the last 20 years, 25 years, uh, our lumber industry in southern Oregon has been basically completely destroyed, costing uh, many tens of thousands of jobs, and that feeds back into the rest of the economy. So uh, in uh, walking door to door a lot during that campaign, I spoke to about a thousand businessmen. Sometimes you talk to them and they just start telling you their troubles. Other times they say, well, what do you do for me if you're elected? And I say, I'll get the government off your back. And then they light up and start talking to you about how the government is making it impossible for them to make a living. 
So we have a, a problem. Our taxes are the highest in the nation on our businessmen. Uh, our regulations are the highest in the nation. Uh, our businesses are not thriving. In District 4, we have a special problem of our congressional representative letting our lumberman's industry be destroyed. And so the biggest issue in District 4, and in fact this is true across the nation, was uh, jobs in the economy. You know, making the stock market go up doesn't provide uh, meaningful employment for the man in the street. At least it hasn't in the last few years. You know, I might add that uh, you were probably one of the first chairs that, while you were chairing um, the, the Republican Party as, uh, as the, the, the chair of the Republican Party, that was running for office at the same time, which kind of, in all due respect, gave you some uh, an advantage in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the races because you were out there on the streets, too, at the same time you were also running an administration. Yes, well, uh, actually, we had five uh, county chairs uh, running uh, for office as well in this election, I think this is a healthy thing. Uh, you have to find people for office. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would be better if we could, uh, if the most outstanding, most respected people in our communities would run and stay in office for a short time. Uh, during the first hundred years of our country, for example, most congressmen served only two years. They were citizen volunteers, and the people who volunteered were recruited by their fellow Americans uh, for these jobs on the basis of their accomplishments. This isn't happening much anymore because the more uh, successful uh, people don't seem to want to fill public office. Mm -hmm. And our political process isn't very good at electing people who have not become career politicians. So if you're looking elsewhere, probably within the party is an excellent place to look because at least party officials have been dedicated volunteers, working hard, most of them, to improve their state and nation. And when I was going around recruiting candidates for the election, I told our county chairs, get the best people in your county to run for office, and if you can't, you're it. And we wound up with five county chairs running for office. I think this is a healthy thing. Well, I, I appreciate the fact that uh, you, you, you had that feeling because, as you know, uh, after you identified me as the engagement chair for the state of Oregon Republican Party, uh, it was suggested that I also run, and I did, and it gave me the same advantage from the standpoint of getting out and meeting the people, and uh, because, as you indicated before, you know, it's about Oregon, and it's about this country, and the issues are out there, and you've got to talk to the people. That's right, and we need the people to stop being concerned about what group they think they're in. Mm -hmm. The people that are defeating our state and nation love these divisions. There's this group and that group and another group, and they're all supposed to be fighting with each other, and the media keeps telling you how they're fighting with each other. When I was debating DeFazio, one thing I said to the audience was, polit the political class says they'll reach across the aisle. I'm, my question is, why is there an aisle? Americans are not in two groups. There isn't a big canyon between two groups of the American people. They are a heterogeneous group. Almost all of us have different ideas than our neighbors. And the idea of separating them into groups by race, by uh, uh, some social issue, by uh, uh, income, all these separations that are, divide us are deliberately made by the political class to divide us so that they can control us. We shouldn't be counting how many red state, how many red politicians we elected to office, or how many blue politicians we elected to office? We should be counting how many great Americans we elected to office, and we shouldn't care which party they're in. Okay, okay. Now let's get down to the the governor's race. Now let's get down into the state of Oregon now for a moment here. Uh, yeah. What about that governor's race day? We had um, actually had the sitting uh, sitting governor, Governor Kitzhopper, and you had Representative Dennis Richardson. Uh, what, do, what do you think about that, and what we, what, what's your response to that? Well, that was a tragedy, uh, a real tragedy. Again, Dennis Richardson has been a great governor for Oregon, and frankly, I hope he runs in four years again, because I think the only problem that Dennis had was that he was from southern Oregon, and he wasn't known widely enough in, uh, in northern Oregon and in, in, Portland, in the Portland area. I think that uh, you know, Dennis, if he runs again, will win, it's tragic he didn't win this time because we need a good governor, and he was sure it. You know, you make a good point, too, because as you know, you got me very much involved 
uh, with uh, his uh, his running, and uh, we spent quite a bit of time on the front end of his campaign here in the metro area. But then, as he got into the campaign, and you know, like anything else, you know, when you when you receive monies from back east or whatever, a lot of times you get sort of foreigners coming in basically running your campaign and all of a sudden we didn't see Dennis for a while and he respectfully said to me that Bruce uh, they're running the campaign yes yeah, so that's that's one of the problems people think that the Republican Party and the Democrat Party are having a contest and that's basically what they think these campaigns are about and that's what the press tells them but there are a lot of other elements in the uh, Democratic side in Oregon, the public employees unions are the main opponent to the Republicans. The Democrats are just the paid subsidiary of the unions. And in both cases, in both parties, the consultants are extremely important. Mm -hmm. These consultants make a lot of money on these campaigns. And once the campaign becomes really, uh, uh, really uh, uh, all-consuming, the last couple of months, and I can tell you the last couple of months of it, congressional race is really something, or in a, in a governor's race is even worse. Mm -hmm. The candidate's uh, so, so caught up with doing his job that he can't plan everything, and he relies upon the consultants. If the consultants do a good job, if they make the right appointments with him, if they make the right alliances, they put him in the right place at the right time, uh, that makes a big difference. But often consultants make errors along these lines. Uh, I know one error was made with respect to your group, and those errors are not the candidate's errors, they're the consultant's errors, because the, the candidate is by then, in the heat of the campaign, depending more and more on his consultants to make his schedule and his events and the things he does uh, as effective as possible. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that, uh, I'm sure you're going to probably respond to that um, uh, in regards to the upcoming election. Right now we're right into a presidential election. We've got two more years, if you will. We'll be right back to the area, and and uh, and folks will be running for Congress in other areas, right? Yeah, that's right. Two more years. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, uh, again, about the upcoming election. We've got these two more years aspect of it. What are, what are your plans, if you will, um, uh, for this next, for the next two years in terms of uh, where do we go? Where, where does the Republican Party go for this point? Uh, in Oregon? Yes. Oh, in the nation. <laughs> Let, let's in say in nation, Oregon. In the nation, I think we're okay, nation, yes. You okay. know, Oregon's only 1% of the nation, and right. we just sit here and watch. But we, we, uh, we don't have much say. But in Oregon, we do have a lot of say. And we've just got to do a better job in the Republican Party because we're, like, we're selecting great candidates and not getting them into office. Uh, I plan to help with that in any way that uh, we can, my family and I can be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what, does, what that uh, will consist of at this time. We're uh, all looking at the election. Uh, the Republican Party is reorganizing at this time of year, the county parties and the state party have reorganization meetings and decide who the leadership will be for the coming two years and so forth. And so I don't know what our analysis will lead to, but I hope it leads to uh, a better result because we haven't been doing a good enough job to win with what we have. Well, I, in all due respect, I'm not trying to trying to butter it up or whatever, but I want to I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate. Uh, because as you, as you know, when we met, um, I was very impressed from the standpoint of how you identified uh, my participation as an engagement chair as opposed to a minority chair of the party. That's, that, that was a first, as far as I'm concerned, in the history of the of the party, or uh, for either party for that matter. What was your well, rationale for doing that? Well, it, it just makes it's common sense. This business of dividing Americans by race is a profitable only for the professional racists on both sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference between a black man and a white man, or a, if you want a brown man, if you want to say, for, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to, people aren't exactly those colors, but you right. know what I mean. Right. The differences between people on the basis of the color of their skin are just non-existent. They're just not different. We're all Americans. And this thing where there are separate groups is just ridiculous. It's ridiculous for the Republican Party to designate some person who's going to go over to the black community and say, oh, I'm here to outreach to you. We need your votes. This is ridiculous. Um, what you say to that community 
just like you say to every community in Oregon, where are your candidates? We came here to make sure you've got great candidates from this part of Oregon so that they can run for office and win. And you and I felt the same way about it. That's mm -hmm. why we used engagement instead of outreach. We'd start realizing that we're all Americans, and these divisions are ridiculous. They're not just tragic, they're ridiculous. If we stop succumbing to these divisions and the people on both sides who profit from promoting these divisions, our country would be a better place, and we'd have a lot better politicians elected to office, too. Okay. Another area that I'd like for you to, to, to respond to is that, because I know you've got background, you had, you had a major involvement in regards to education with your own kids and whatever, and, and, and the success you had in regards to educating them, sort of the homeschooling aspect of it. What did you hear on the, on the streets about the education issues that we're having here in Oregon? Because trust me, in the metro area here, we got more failure than any parts of the state. I mean, besides the fact we got failure out, outside of this area too, but it's a major, major issue. What, what has been your response in regards to that? Well, what I'm seeing out there is the, uh, of course, the people running the education system now who just promote what they're doing and ask for more money, uh, but also a lot of Americans that know this isn't working, and a lot of them agree with the uh, analysis I've made. I've been an educator all my life. I was a professor at UC San Diego, teaching uh, college students and graduate students, and uh, my family has worked in K-12 through education and provided materials to about 100,000 students, homeschooled and supplements for public schools. But the, uh, the, thing, that, the thing is, about 50 years ago, America had the best schools in the world, far none. There was no comp competition. Those schools were locally controlled. The parents, the teachers, the community, and the students worked together to make those schools work. And the school districts across the country all competed with one another to have the best school districts and the best schools. It worked and it was fabulous. Today, we have a political class that says, we know your children better than you do. This class in Washington and in Salem is developing top-down education, one size fits all, for all of our students and telling our teachers and, and communities how they have to educate their kids. And the result is, as you'd expect, America is about 20th in the world in terms of quality of education per country, and Oregon is pretty far down on the list in the United States. We have to get the government off the backs of our schools. Sure, they're public schools, and they're run by our local governments, but they need to be run by our local governments, not by these nuts and Washington and even in Salem, who decide they're going to provide one-size-fits-all education and throw in a lot of social engineering and political uh, propaganda besides. Okay. What about the economy? Can you respond to that? Because I know you've been, you're getting all sorts of questions about that piece, and, and what, what do you see as a solution to that issue? Well, that's pretty Oregon. simple, just, get, just to get the government off the backs of the businessmen. Small business generates almost all the jobs, new jobs in this country, and small business is suffering throughout the country. It's suffering for two reasons. One, it has the highest taxes in the world being paid by our small businessmen. And two, the government regulations are so onerous that it forces the businessman to waste a lot of the money he doesn't lose in taxes. This is happening throughout the United States. This plus bureaucratic interference with the use of the natural resources of our country has put us in a pretty bad position. And we've lost a very large part of our manufacturing base, our business, small businessmen are suffering. If we don't solve this problem, we're going to find out that we're second rate and everything else in the world, too. It's a very serious problem, and of course it's devastating to the millions upon millions upon millions of young people that are coming out of college and high school, and those that had jobs that have lost them. There are so many people in this country searching for jobs that just want to work hard, do something productive, and make a living that can't because the government won't let them. And this has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the areas that I want, I, you know, that I was very sensitive to and, and was very much aware is that how much of an effort uh, was made uh, by some of the party members in regards to the whole issue of, of, of President Obama and, and, and th throwing more negative side of it and a lot of times not dealing with the issues that they were at hand. 
Uh, do you think we're going to be spending more time again, i.e., basically um, uh, talking to basically, uh, in all due respects, attacking uh, President Obama? He's not going to be running for president anymore. <laughs> what, what about the issues? What about the issues? Well, of course, I'm, I, uh, I, I have a lot of differences with Mr. Obama. There are yes, a lot of things right. I think should be done differently sure. than he does. Them. Mm-hmm. Uh, most Republicans do. Uh, on the other hand, and that, that I, and I, I don't want to mitigate that. Right. I, I think he's he's incorrect on quite a few things. On the other hand, uh, this government, the giant bureaucracy, the uh, many of the structures, the career politicians, just endless career politicians looking out for their own good instead of others, is almost impossible for anybody to run. And you feel sorry for this man at the same time you disagree with him. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to imagine how anybody in that office could get anything done when Congress consists of over 500 career politicians that, just, that don't even want to solve the problem. Mm-hmm. They just want to get more votes on the problem. So at the same time I dip, differ with this man, I also feel sorry for him because uh, I don't see how anybody in his job <laughs> could do the job. And that's on both sides of the aisle, by the way. It's not just Republicans. Oh, yeah. I'm not talking about just Democrats being into trouble. The career politicians on the Republican side are causing almost as much trouble. Okay, okay. So so what, what do you think about the future of our party? Everybody keeps asking that question, and we get blamed for a, a lot of the negative side of the deal from the populist standpoint. Well, our party will have a future if it realizes that its job is to recruit great candidates for office and support them so that they can be elected. Now, that may seem simple to you, but there are an awful lot of people in the party that don't see that as the main goal of the party. <laughs> yes, I know. And if we run, if the Republicans run, the best candidate in a race, vote for them. If we don't, don't. Now, the Republican Party's job is to go out in the community, find first-rate people to run for office, and then get behind them and elect them, and, of course, have within it the professionalism to know how to elect. That's all the party's about. And uh, <laughs> that's all it should be about. <laughs> but we find that they're there within the party, just like within the country. There are divisions and divisions and people with other agendas. And it's very hard to get all these people pointed in the same direction at the same time. My guess is that Democrats have the same problem. It's always hard to get Americans to do something uh, in a unified way because we're all individualists. But uh, the Republican Party has a future if, it'll like, if it will find and nominate the best candidates in the country and be professional enough to get them elected. If it doesn't, it won't have a future if it doesn't do that. You know, I was going to ask you the question about the enthusiasm. And uh, do you feel that uh, some of the, some of the uh, let's put it this way, some of the, some of the key folks in the party uh, are feeling that enthusiasm about going the direction that you're that you're talking to right now in regards to recruitment and this that, and the other? Well, first let me say that there are many enthusiastic, hardworking uh, Republicans in the Oregon Republican Party that are dedicated to just exactly what I just said. Good. Uh, and those people are to be admired. They did a great job. They did elect some candidates to office, and they worked their hearts out to try to elect the rest. At the same time, there are within our party people with an entirely different agenda, and they are troublesome for all of us. Okay. Well, again, another another thing, a couple of things I want to ask you about also, too. People are very interested in the whole issue of term limits, and as you note, know, the person you happen to run against, uh, Congressman DeFazio, <laughs> has been in there forever, so to speak. And, and I like, like Bloomin' Hour, you got Bloomin' Hour. 15th term. What, what, do you, what, what do you think about that? How, how, how do we deal with that situation? Well, the Founding Fathers... Uh, we'll talk about Congress, that's what you mentioned. The Founding Fathers made uh, you made the congressman up for election every two years. And the idea was that they'd be immediately responsive to people, and they intended these jobs to be filled by volunteers that served for a short time. And for the first hundred years of our country, most congressmen served just one term. The average was just a little, a few served two terms, not many. And that worked because basically uh, someone who was admired and respected and trusted in the community it would, it would be not sort of uh, recruited by his fellow Americans to run for office and somebody else of similar qualities would be maybe recruited by somebody else. He'd have an election. He'd be there two years. That works. What doesn't work is career politicians. 
as soon as that guy's been in office long enough that he wants it, that he wants to stay, that he sees it as a career, then his values change. Because what becomes important then is what will keep him in office. And therefore, every time he has a decision to make, there's a conflict of interest between his career and what's best for the people. That's why Washington isn't working today. Okay. It's entirely in the hands of people like Mr. DeFazio, whose main interest is staying in office. Mm -hmm. Now they come back at election time, they don't care whether they tell the truth, they lie their heads off, mm -hmm. because they've noticed certain kinds of lies, we get them reelected. And the whole thing is, is really a corrupt mess in many different ways, because we have men and women who are in Congress because they want to stay there rather than because they want to serve. Mm -hmm. What about what about media's role? Do how, you think they're 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 enthusiastic about uh, the term limits and getting the, do, doing the right thing? Well, the media, of course, uh, they're entertainers, and therefore they uh, like to talk to us about the things that seem to entertain their readers and their audiences and so forth. Uh, and they, uh, but they aren't. I think the media doesn't look at these things in sufficient depth. It uh, has a rather shallow view of things, you know, okay. get a story and publish it before you even think. And I, I think our media is falling down on the job. Uh, people accuse them of being left-wing. Uh, there is a tendency for them to be more liberal, but I think the main problem is they don't look at things and report them in depth. They look too shallowly at things, and our people need more, more information. Okay. Okay. All right. Look here. We're sort of like running out of time, but I want to thank you. And I definitely got to ask you a little quick point, yes or no. Are you going to run again? You should. <laughs> haven't decided. All right. <laughs> are you going to possibly run for the chair again? Well, I haven't decided. All right. Those are, those are, those are good answers. <laughs> it's a long time away. We just got through with the. We just got through these elections. I haven't decided. It's I heard that a lot of things, and we'll make up our minds when the time comes. Well, once you decide, that's when I'll serve too. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you very, very much, and we're well, looking forward to working with you, with you more. Bruce, you're, you're a great man and a great show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Have a good evening. Bye. Okay, good. Bye. Well, folks, there you have it. Uh, you, you heard from the chair of the Republican Party, and it's giving you sort of an insight in terms of uh, the, the past and the future of Oregon's Republican Party, and um, I think it's going to be quite a task. It's going to be it's going to be something else. And but the right man is in the in he's he's right there, and he's and as far as I'm concerned, the guy really has got it on board. So thank you very much. I'll see you next week. We're going to have a very interesting show next week. I'm not going to tell you what, but I tell you what, it's going to be very interesting and very enlightening. Have a good day. Take care. Enjoy.